Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to continue on with Michel Foucault's The Archaeology of Knowledge, covering part three. And then next time we'll cover part four, and then that'll conclude it for us. But before jumping into it, obviously go check out the other episodes if you haven't already. It'd be strange if you were here without listening to those, but I don't know, maybe you've been assigned to read this part of the book and, you know, you want the verbal spark notes. And if I can help in that way, that's great. Um, you know the deal. You can follow me on other things. You can help monetarily or just by liking and sharing and all that with links in the description and you know how to do all that stuff. Consider, uh, really though, if you're considering donating, instead, donate to one of the organizations below that are working to help Palestinians living under Israeli apartheid. They need, from Gaza to the West Bank, all help that we can provide. So please consider doing that if, if you can. Uh, and if helping Palestinians bothers you, you can leave. So that's there's that too. So yeah, here we go. Part three, the statement and the archive. Here, to give you the broad, the broad strokes, just to get an idea of what he's actually getting into here, in this part, he's going to look specifically at enunciations. So like specific statements, not statements specifically, but the idea of statements, the idea of enunciations within any given field, within a discursive field. So what allows some ideas to come into fruition as statements that could then belong to a field, that could then be intelligible and then clumped within a field? Clumped is such a it's a horrible word, but that's what we have. That's what I got. You got the word clumped, and here we go. So, so far, he has left the statement unexamined. He hasn't really talked about it at all. He's talked more broadly what discursive functions are at play, what discursive regularities allow certain ideas to become part of a discursive field. He's revealed the paradox of any given field or discipline like sociology or anthropology or anything, that on the one hand is quite strict in what it allows to belong to that field, while on the other hand, in order for any field or discipline to actually exist, it has to always accommodate some amount of newness. It has to permit new ideas to flourish to push the field forward. And, you know, beyond that, it has to resonate with various other forces outside of that discipline, be they political or religious or economic forces and so on, that it resonates with in order to drum up larger public support to accrue funds and, and, and support in any other way that you can think of. And the key to reading Foucault and understanding his analyses is that He's never looking at an institution in isolation, because that's impossible. At, at the core of his work is looking at the very possibility of institutionalization. And he examines that logic. That's kind of the core of what he's doing. You know, there might be some staunch Foucauldians who are actually like, no, no, no. Foucault is really looking at the process of subject, subjectification. But putting that aside for now, one of his central projects is to interrogate how we actually develop institutions and why in our world do institutions hold the weight that they do, the power that they do, and have as much sway on the social body as they do? What purposes do they serve? So that's kind of some of the stuff we've talked about now, statements. Now, like the actual enunciations of discourse. So discourse, in Foucault's words, is sometimes the general do domain of all statements. Sometimes it's an individualized group of statements. And sometimes it is a regulated practice that accounts for a certain number of statements. Because after all, no discipline, no discursive field exists without statements. But what are they? Like, is a statement... In sociology, like, what's a, what's a sociological statement? I don't know. Um, God, 
who studies sociology? Uh, Durkheim's idea about altruistic uh, death by suicide, for example. Uh, maybe this is a, a, a sociological statement. It's something that belongs to the domain very comfortably in sociology. Maybe something someone would read in an intro to sociology course. But what else can count as statements? And even that statement, what is it really? Well, is it is it a proposition? Is it a speech act? Is it just any sentence? Not really. It's not really any of these things. It's not a proposition because we can have one proposition stated in different ways with the differences containing like different significations. So, for example, in the discursive field of matrimony, marriage, to say marry me versus I want you to marry me are two very different things. Yet they point to the same thing. They both propose the same outcome. That is, their functions are similar, but they, they, these are widely different, wildly different things, and they, are, they use different words, and they're different sentences, yet as propositions are kind of the same, but really, it would be silly to think that these two things are the same. One is very much beckoning something to happen, whereas other, the other might be more of a, um, a request, which in that context obviously holds very significant weight. So are statements then sentences? Just sentences? It doesn't matter, like, in the differences between these two examples, marry me versus I want you to marry me, is it that their differences don't really matter? What is actually universal between them is that they are sentences? Well, no, because, you know, many of you are probably a little bit familiar with a thing called math, and math is riddled with statements without sentences. X, X, X is equal to minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A is, for example, the quadratic formula. Or A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared in Pythagorean formula or theorem, whatever. Uh, and in this case, these are these are statements, but they are not sentences. That is, they do not comply with that other discursive field of linguistics or English linguistics as to what constitutes a proper sentence. So maybe a statement is like a speech act then. A speech act being something that unites or is the designation of a kind of speech that implies an action. So for example, uh, the probably the most common example from Austin who had really um, developed this idea of speech act theory or speech acts is that in the case of matrimony again when the person marrying some a couple and two people or more uh, w says I now pronounce you for example husband and wife common saying within uh, within the marriage ceremony and in saying that something real happens there is a unity occurring that has been accepted institutionally, socially, culturally, and has a lot of weight. That is, the weight of that statement extends far beyond the words itself. After all, I mean, this is a statement, right? To say, I pronounce you husband and wife. It is a statement attached to a cultural contract, uh, an oath, and a promise. The problem is that not all statements really do things in this way. Like, this is a specific kind of statement. So, so far, we, you know, we don't know what a statement is. Is it, It's not just a sentence. It's not a proposition. It's not a speech act. Like, what's really, what's really going on here? There may be examples of statements that are propositions, sentences, and speech acts, but they aren't congruent. There might be examples, then, of these things being statements, propositions being statements, sentences being statements, but that does not mean that all statements are then propositions or speech acts or sentences. So if you're getting the sense now that this seems like a very complicated issue, and maybe there isn't an easy answer, then you're right. We're going to get more into it, and we're going to explore some more of the complexities here. But the thing that Foucault really wants to draw our attention to, and one of his other really big projects across all of his work, is to deconstruct, not in the Derridian sense, but to deconstruct 
or to interrogate the assumed rational consistency that many institutions claim to embody, claim to engender, claim to deploy, where discursive fields are comprised of statements that we don't even understand how they work. And it doesn't actually seem like there is a quote-unquote logical explanation for them. Instead, it just seems to be that their cohesion, the cohesion of a specific field, the organization of specific statements together to form that field has actually nothing to do with there being a unifying, universal, rational principle for these statements and a lot more to do with these specific statements satisfying certain established interests, satisfying certain discursive regularities that could then be used to further the very project of that discipline. So the only unifying thread then, and I'm being quite reductive here, obviously it's more complicated than this, but just to get you thinking about it, the unifying thread are the interests that underwrite those collections of statements. There isn't a logic to be found among the statements themselves. Instead, that logic is to be found from without and is then imposed upon these statements and then made to made, make sense after the fact. It's like when Nietzsche, in Truth and Lying in a Non-Moral Sense, writes about mammals. And he's like, humans have created the concept of mammals. That mammals don't exist in nature. That that word doesn't hold any meaning in nature. No two mammals look at one another and they're like, yeah, we're tight. We're tight, you know, we're both mammals. Yeah, we both belong to this common uh, genus, whatever, species, thing. I don't know what, what you'd call that organizing thing to label, um, to label these things uh, mammals or even like arachnids, like as though two spiders recognize in each other a kind of similarity. Uh, they might, but we don't know that. In any case, what is actually happening there when the scientist goes out in nature and finds a mammal, Nietzsche's example is to say, when this scientist says, oh, look, a mammal, they are actually not uh, furthering or discovering something in nature. What they are only discovering is their desire to control nature. They are only discovering their desire to put a face on nature and to organize it, to make it human, all too human, you might say. But let's go more basic here to return to the question of statements. What is the relationship between statements and language? Is language just simply a tool used to organize statements that then hold significant cultural meaning? Where language is just this neutral, uh, neutral tool that we all have access to? Well, no, absolutely not. Language is not this neutral thing that we all just somehow possess. You know, the, the Chomsky people would be saying, oh, well, yeah, you know, we all harbor the, the ability to acquire language, and that's all well and good, fantastic. But the actual way that that language manifests has nothing to do with a human's ability to actually uh, learn that language. Because what the human is learning are specific rules and codes and regulations with which to then guide their use of language. So language itself takes a lot of training and refining to actually uh, to, to actually become something that is intelligible in the world. And you must abide by its rules and regulations in order to remain intelligible, let alone if you tried to access some esoteric field uh, that, you know, strictly, strictly polices what language can be used. But there's a kind of, I mean, I've just given you some basic descriptions about language, to show that language is not this neutral thing that just exists out there in the world. Instead, it is bound up with the very statements, the kinds of statements we've been trying to uncover. How else can we understand language other than through basic rules and regulations, in other words, statements, that we use to make sense of it? How else can we understand language unless we've, uh, within English at least, unless we've uh, categorized all things called nouns? and just said, 
these are things that we call nouns and when we, we clump them together and we unite them under that umbrella of being nouns even though two nouns don't actually have anything else in common other than them being branded with the same word and Foucault puts it really well when he writes that the language exists only as a system for constructing possible statements but in another respect it exists only as a description obtained from a collection of real statements so we need language to form statements we use statements to understand rules and, and so on which we then use to understand language so what really comes first and this is one of the you know, great mysteries about language because language is so rule oriented and rules come from histories that have established these rules uh, and that allow you know rules to even form through language how do we then try to imagine the first languages forming if they depend upon rules that imply that language was required to create language i don't know if i said that as well as i could i hope it was clear all that we know so far then about statements is that it is a function that cuts across a domain of structures and possible unities and which reveals them with concrete contents in time and space and that puts us to the next chapter chapter 9 the enunciative function statements allow signs to exist and enables rules or forms to become manifest statements do not refer to things as with a signifier or signified or proposition or referent signifier signified the word tree referring to the tall thing out in nature you know it doesn't work that way with statements statements aren't neatly referring to something instead they are kind of rule oriented they are guides they are part of a broader system that only works alongside other statements yet don't point to those other statements in themselves like there's nothing that really unites if you look at them the quadratic formula x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a there's nothing that really unites that and a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared uh i hope i'm not messing up these formulas it's been years whatever if you look at these two there's they don't really share much there's there's some random letters thrown together uh that you know someone with a trained eye can probably find the similarities or how the pythagorean theorem might be a useful tool to proving the quadratic formula i have no idea but they don't statements don't work in a neat signifier signified type relationship as other things in language do so for example you know examples are useful what if i gave you this following sentence colorless green ideas sleep furiously what is that what is that what does that evoke in you colorless green ideas sleep furiously is that a statement well you'd have to ask to what does it belong because on its own it's not really a statement put aside the fact that we you listening to me me speaking to you uh this is like a discursive field with certain rules and parameters that's why i don't swear here even though i swear all the time in real life so if we put this discursive field aside for a moment i know that's idealistic just bear with me pretend this isn't a discursive field that sentence colorless green ideas sleep furiously means nothing it means nothing you probably can't make any sense of it it do certainly doesn't exist as a statement it's not pointing or belonging to any field that it is comfort comfortably nestled in and that gives it meaning and that it gives meaning to that's not it's not what's happening here it is incomprehensible it is unintelligible however what if i told you that colorless green ideas sleep furiously happened to come from the mouth of someone who just woke up from a dream and was communicating that to their psychoanalyst or their therapist or whatever suddenly the wheel starts spinning and suddenly this sentence that a moment ago meant nothing 
starts to mean a little bit more. Or what if I said that it came from the mouth of someone suffering from schizophrenia? Maybe. And in that case, to a psychiatrist or mental health expert, it actually means a whole lot. Now, this has been the same sentence the whole way, and its meaning actually has nothing to do with the language used or with, you know, the specific words or the structure of the sentence itself. The meaning has entirely to do with this broader consideration of whether or not it is analyzable. Analyzable in accordance with a specific field. Because you cannot analyze anything unless you are approaching it with some kind of knowledge or some kind of backing with which or lens through which to actually engage something to understand it. So statements are then for Foucault, they don't refer to objects like we said, or to other statements that neatly. They instead refer to laws of possibility, rules of existence for the objects that are named, designated, or described within it, and for the relations that are affirmed or denied in it. So a statement can then never really be analyzed on its own at the level of grammar or enunciation or anything like that. It must be analyzed by considering the relations between the statement and the spaces of differentiation. What space is this statement actually coming out in? You know, what discursive space does it exist in? So we have yet to really consider the place of the subject here. Who is the person speaking who says colorless ideas sleep furiously, whatever the sentence was? Who is this person? What role do they, do they place here? I mean, it's kind of important, too, because statements are stated by people. And as we've said, and it should be clear, like the very languages themselves that we've just been describing that often are assumed to be neutral, you know, languages exist out there. Foucault's showing us that's not really the case. So, too, are these subjects not really just neutral. And this doesn't mean to look at someone's psychology and say, oh, they're saying this thing because of X reason. You know, they might have had some trauma in the past, and that's why they're saying something, as though we can reduce a statement's intelligibility to the motivations of the person speaking it, because statements extend far beyond just an individual person. If that was truly the case, then nothing would be intelligible at all, because people would just be saying gibberish, that makes no sense to anyone else. We say things in accordance with basic rules and discursive fields, as I've been saying over and over and over again, and I hope that I haven't bored you by saying it over and over again. And so here he's not looking at the subject in that way, finding their secret motivations, you know, or reasons that they might think something or say something. Instead, he's calling into question the very phenomenon of the subject itself. If something can be called a statement, in his words, it is not because one day someone happened to speak them, or to say a statement, or put them into some concrete form of writing, it is because the position of the subject can be assigned. So think of the examples I gave before. I gave before. Colorless ideas sleep furiously, whatever. When I gave the examples of someone suffering from schizophrenia, or someone having woken up from a dream, or anything like that, I have given you the image of someone providing a testimony a subject who is being analyzed by somebody else. And this come, will come to organize so many institutions in our world where it is a matter of somebody showing up to someone else and then speaking their truth, at least as much as it makes sense to them, speaking their truth, that that other person is going to carefully make sense of with all of their knowledge, everything that they've learned, so that you, the subject, can better understand yourself from what you've already said. And different people will give different answers. Maybe the psychoanalyst is going to point to your parental structure, you know, your relationship with your parents or your mother specifically as a way to understand something that someone might say. Your psychiatrist might say there's maybe a chemical imbalance in your brain or something like that whatever the case may be, in all of these examples, and 
the thing that underwrites the very logic of institutionalization that we so we we very much take for we don't really take for granted we don't even recognize in our world because it's so ubiquitous it's like water to a fish what underwrites institutionalization is the assumption that there must be an encounter between a subject and someone observing that subject when historically that has not been the case knowledge has been something that has happened been developed more communally in community settings with one another not in closed off doctor's offices with one person trying to understand one other person and Foucault attributes this in part to the Catholic Church and the confessional booth where the confessional booth is that site where someone is supposed to give up their truths and because they're sins the sins are the most true things that people ever speak according to the church and he, the history of sexuality explains this in a lot more detail and there's that priest there who has the soul arbitration ability the soul deciding whatever to absolve you of your sins to essentially grant you uh to to grant you a place in heaven so statements are then contextual it should seem obvious enough but not in the cultural or epistemic sense that that would be way too reductive here you know he's not saying that oh we should just approach like if we observe like within um a doctor's office what is what is way too common is like sexism within the medical profession for example where women especially women of color aren't listened to by doctors or their pain and suffering is often just simply disregarded or reduced to something else Foucault isn't saying in the face of that to identify and say that the problem with this institution here is patriarchal influence as though you know we're looking at the cultural context here being patriarchy so while i think that would be a concern for him what he's doing here is he's saying like yeah you know you can analyze it in that way we have to take it a step further though and also interrogate the very ability for such uh for such a cultural context to actually make sense and to actually be adopted in this institution in this interaction how does the very dynamic between subject and observer actually lend itself to patriarchy and how does it actually encourage it for example among other things and patriarchy racism for example yeah you know, easy examples off the top of my head here do not account for how statements and even within like feminism for example that is its own discursive field that has very strict codes and rules especially academic feminism on what can be said and how those things should be said in order to be taken seriously that is what Foucault is getting at Foucault is asking us to consider because we just never consider this what rules are actually in place and where do these rules come from that guide the formation of these fields and disciplines and finally i mean not really finally we got a lot more to talk about uh, but talking about statements statements must have some materiality some kind of tangibleness tangibility some materiality it is too obvious to say that a sentence has different meanings if it is found in a newspaper article versus a an academic journal whatever obviously statements hold different meanings in these different contexts materiality though here he he means something different so imagine your favorite book whatever it is lord of the rings wow something by zadie smith whatever you, whatever you're reading now now imagine it's reprinted 10 times probably reprinted a whole lot more than that whatever each of those books are different right but they contain the same statement and what is that statement well in his words a book it is a locus of exact equivalence for the statements for them it is an authority that permits repetition without any changes of identity what i've called in a previous episode here the book form the book is is itself a kind of statement even though the words might be reprinted maybe the words are even altered yet there is something being conveyed in its existing as a book 
as materiality. No statement exists outside of material. You know, you encounter a statement in some kind of a setting. Either you're reading it on a page or you encounter a statement within a within a doctor's office in which there's this clear delineation of different roles and, and subjectivity and so on. It all implies a kind of embodiment in a lot of cases and materiality. Being somewhere, holding something, reading something, and these material spaces or things are statements themselves. And they are imbued with a whole lot of meaning and a whole lot of, uh, they are expected to hold up the entire discursive framework like the statements, any other statement itself. But not everything can be replicated, for example. Take, for example, your birth certificate. You know, does it hold the same weight when it's been replicated? You could try take it to the border if you needed it for something or prove your identity if you brought a photocopy of your birth certificate. Good luck. Uh, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> That's probably not going to work. So in this case, we see that, you know, the real material thing in this context, in the case of a birth certificate, holds a lot more value. Even though the photocopy might be an exact replica, replication, it doesn't hold the same meaning. So the words themselves, the very things that they point to, the exact, the, the essence of what it is doing that is providing your date of birth, where you were born, your name, yada, 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 actually is maybe not the thing that matters. But it should seem so obvious that that is the thing that matters, or those are the things that matter. But no, you know, so there's there's a lot to unpack here. The rule of materiality that statements necessarily obey in his words is therefore of the order of the institution rather than of the spatiotemporal localization. It defines possibilities of reinscription and transcription. So, for example, a book can be re replicated, it might actually earn more value as it's replicated, where you see on a, on a book, it's like 10 million copies sold. It's very replication is a sign of its success and its value. If you did that with a birth certificate, you would probably go to jail, you know, no one else, you know, people might be asking like, why do you have 10 million copies of your birth certificate? 10 million copies sold of the birth certificate. That might be a little bit shady. Uh, I don't recommend you do that. But, you know, you see how these things have different meanings. So materiality is another kind of discourse. Materiality is another piece of evidence to possibly analyze and understand the different places, the different kinds of material and materiality, the kind of value that they hold. So statements are irreducible to context. They're also... Uh, not reducible to a kind of linguistic form. Statements are modifiable and adaptable according to all the above, everything we've said so far, different rules and regulations and so on. To say the earth is round, for example, is, it kind of means something. It's, it's, it has significant weight. But its significance is actually totally different before and after Copernicus. If you know, 2,000 years ago, not even that far, if I said the earth was round 800 years ago, I might not be here, you know? Bad things might happen to me if I was in Europe, <laughs> you know, where Europe lags behind in a lot of ways. I would probably not be here, you know? But if I say the earth is round now, uh, people look at me and they're probably, they're like, yeah, <laughs> what, why are you saying this? So the words are the same, but they mean very different things. So we can't just reduce it to context and be like, oh, uh, well, yeah, it's because the setting back then, people didn't really know the truth. Now they know the truth. Therefore, we can explain the different ways that this statement actually holds value. But that doesn't answer the question of how a statement, how any collection of words can either be exalted and celebrated, or highly disciplined. From what authority is a statement like that disciplined to say that the earth is round? Well, in Europe, for example, it might be religious authority that has a whole lot of backing 
from its own discursive field and understanding. If I just walked into a village where no one had any conception of the world at all, and I said, uh, well, the earth is round, chances are nothing would happen. I don't know. I mean, I'm just assuming nothing would happen. But that it was met, that statement was met with such resistance, really demands us move beyond just being like, oh, context, people didn't understand back then. And understanding that it's a lot more than that. There was an entire discursive regulative field that forbade, forbid, forbade those, that collection of words coming together that was intelligible, it was understandable in being dangerous, in being deviant, which is only possible according to another when another basic discursive regime has been established. So to return to materiality, because it's connected to this conversation of discourse, whatever its form, words, thought that is spoken materially in a material setting, and so on, it allows the statement to emerge. It is the way for the statement to emerge. Once it emerges in Foucault's words, it circulates, is used, disappears, allows or prevents the realization of a desire, serves or resists various interests, participates in challenge and struggle, and becomes a theme of appropriation or rivalry. And if the if this wasn't going on, then the statement the earth is round would have nothing would have happened 800 years ago, but a lot happens if you say those words, if I'd said those words. And that puts us here into chapter 10, the description of statements. So discourse is constituted by groups of signs acting as statements that comply with specific modalities of existence, rules, that lend them their intelligibility alone, on their own, and together. And so it is possible to speak of, for example, clinical discourse, economic discourse, medical discourse, whatever. So different discourses. And Foucault isn't so naive as to think that there are just these broad discursive fields. Rather, think of think of a circle and when I did this, when I covered this text many years ago with my friend Alex, he gave the example of concentric circles where you have one big circle and then a smaller circle and then a smaller circle and that, yada, yada, yada. And that's, that's a good illustration, definitely. I like to think of it as like, um, one. imagine a circle around one discursive field, let's call, say, sociology, for example. But then it's important to recognize that there's going to be connections especially among certain parts of sociology, let's say public health, that is going to form part of a circle or occupy part of another circle that connects to the elements of public health within a certain powerful disciplinary apparatus, and that is government. And so the government's knowledge of, um, of public health is going to complete that circle. So you have one broad circle, let's you know, be reductive, one broad circle of sociology, and then you have another circle emanating from or encapsulating, while it still belongs to that big circle, encapsulating sociolo sociological understandings of public health that happens to connect with governmental conversations about public health. And there you have another discursive field. And so you have these circles that overlap and that jut out from one another and connect to other circles or other spheres or ovals or whatever, maybe ovals is a better illustration, that really problematizes any ability to clump them together <laughs> or to just homogenize them. But still, it's important to, to acknowledge that these have had real effects, like what he's going to go on to discuss, clinical discourse, medical discourse, the reason they have enjoyed such uh, such celebration, they've been exalted so much, is that they have been culturally really recognized in their uniformity, in their homogeneity. Even if it's a lot more, we know it's a lot more complicated than that. So again, just to iterate, reiterate, iterate, we must stress that statements cannot be studied autonomously on their own, like a sentence can, right? To study a statement means to define the conditions in which the function that gave a series of signs an existence and a specific existence can operate. They exist in according to these broader fields. 
And if this discussion is seems is kind of new to you, that is maybe you you never really thought about these this thing called statements or how they work within discursive fields. I mean, that's the point. Statements are neither latent nor manifest. They they never come out and say, "Oh, uh, th the reason this sentence works is because um, it complies with the various rules and modalities of this discursive field." You just encounter a sentence that probably has been repeated over and over and over again. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know it belongs to this domain. I know this is something I'm used to hearing. Uh, so that's fine. You never really dig into it. And that's the point. It's kind of hidden in its own obviousness within a discursive field. Statements condition all reference and meaning found in a discursive field that then slowly gives way to new statements as it flows through time. It's meant to birth newness while canceling itself out in its almost sacrificing itself to a discursive field. So you give something a name and then that opens up an entire new domain of possibility once that thing has been named, once a new statement has been given to something, once a concept has been created. And there's, I think there's... Definitely can go after Deleuze and Guattari here and what is philosophy. I'm definitely on the Foucault side of things. Uh, I think in my, you know, on my brain side, I'm, a, I'm on the Foucault side of things here. But in my heart, I'm on the Deleuze and Guattari side. When they say that philosophy is the process of creating concepts, giving names to things, essentially, giving names to ideas, which they just describe essentially as being like this act of spontaneous creativity. When Foucault is like, uh, wait a second, like, you can't just come up with a word or a term and expect everyone to then like clap and be like, oh my God, that was amazing, genius, uh, wonderful you've given us this new idea. No, it has to go through rigorous, it has to go through a regular, rigorous selection process. It has to be endlessly vetted in order to earn the status of a concept through these regulatory mechanisms and processes. Uh, which I find Deleuze and Guattari sometimes don't take into account all that much. But on the other hand, I see where they're coming from. Maybe I'll do an episode just on that. I don't know. That puts us here into chapter 11. Rarity, exteriority, accumulation. So to analyze discourse is to acknowledge its dual status as a totality and as a plethora of heterogeneous texts and statements. So you have uh, the broad domain of sociology. But it's not homogenous. It's comprised of many different ideas, many different terms, books, etc. It is the homogenous whole of a field and or a period that lends intelligibility to individual statements or artifacts or ideas, whatever, within that field. And that arise within it under its purview. It is both then uniform and heterogeneous. And like I said before, this is its paradox. For a field to remain relevant, it has to always adopt newness. But for a field to actually earn uh, its status, it has to abide by certain rules, certain statements, certain elements of itself that has given it its identity. Now, to perform discourse analysis means to do a whole lot more than simply to look at what has been said. It also asks that we look at what hasn't been said which is kind of an impossible thing. Who knows what hasn't been said? But it means to look at those things that maybe actually have been said, but that have been disregarded by a certain discursive field. So one of the examples I like to give is in the case of conspiracy theories, where if you look among the most notorious conspiracy theorists, take Alex Jones, for example, in the US, uh, there are many more, for example, and he is part of a discursive field. As much as uh, political leaders and media pundits and, you know, our academic intelligentsia likes to be like, oh, it's totally irrational nonsense. I think that does a complete disservice to actually understanding the ways in which Alex Jones's discourse is highly regulated. It is highly rational in the way that Foucault's describing it here, following the rules and regularities of discourse. If we look at Alex Jones, you know, there's one thing we can we can ask, and that is like, how come Alex Jones 
refuses to acknowledge a white man conspiracy to take over the world despite all evidence pointing to it. Where he'll, you know, he's going to point to evidence of water making men effeminate or turning them gay, whatever really problematic nonsense he's, he's spouting. How come, despite the most the obvious evidence of white men holding all of the power, historically in the U.S. having all the economic wealth, the majority of it, how come to the conspiracy theorists that is unimaginable, that there's a white man conspiracy? How come they are unable to make that connection? Well, it's simply because it is not intelligible for them. It is an example of rarity here. It is something that does not belong to that discursive field. Even though, you know, me just, I'm pretending I'm, I can be this neutral, rational person on the outside being like, why don't you look at this thing? Obviously, the answer is simple. The answer is super simple. It does not comply with Alex Jones's specific discursive field. So when we look at rarity, we're asking what things are not being said or included among a discursive field, and what does that tell us about that field? Now, as for exteriority, it is the next step beyond rarity. It looks at, or it is, it is to perform an analysis of statements, not to search for hidden or secret meanings, uh, crafted by some architects of history and knowledge, like almost to reduce history to a conspiracy and be like, this is the real motivation behind the creation of this, this discursive field. One day, this 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 bloke woke up and he was like, oh, well, I'm going to create this discursive field and everyone's going to follow its rules and yada, yada, yada. That's not what happens. It is instead to look at the discursive regularities as an autonomous enterprise in themselves. What is actually at play for a, for a discursive field to emerge? What are these logics of regulation that allow a discursive field to uh, have its own boundaries and rules? That is what exteriority aims to identify. Now, obviously, many texts comprise a discursive field. Lots of books. There are a lot of sociology books. And each contains elements that situate it in the field and that also set them apart. You know, that can actually, you can put Durkheim and Marx on the same sociology shelf, even though they're saying wildly different things. But this is an example of accumulation. Because even today, Durkheim's probably a little bit outdated in terms of sociological understandings of suicide or, or anything else that Durkheim may have studied. We may have moved beyond Durkheim in a lot of ways. I don't know. Not really a sociologist. Uh, so, you know, maybe we have, maybe we haven't. I don't know. In any case, this is an example of accumulation where discursive fields hold on to elements of the past, various different ideas that it brings with it through time while also getting rid of others, uh, getting rid of those ideas that may have grown outdated because they are not accommodating a changing discursive terrain. But in order for a discursive field to have, have its legitimacy, it has to accumulate, hence accumulation, a wide array of different ideas casting a wide enough net to attain academic and public interest while also remaining true to itself, abiding by its own uh, regulatory mechanisms. And that puts us here into the 12th chapter, the final one we'll cover in this episode, the historical a priori and the archive. What role does history serve? And the archive, what roles do they serve? Discursive fields are positive, positive in, in philosophical sense, in that they structure what is permitted to belong to that field, and then encourage those ideas. Again, this is a standard Foucauldian idea that power does not work by limiting movement, thought, ideas. Instead, power works by carefully limiting what can be done and then encouraging those acts to actually occur. And then in that way, people feel as subjects like they are free when in fact they are actually only existing according to these basic principles, these regulations that have been set out before them. And it's not always clear nor quote-unquote rational, you know, what unites these disparate ideas together. 
what is it that really unites Plato, St. Augustine, Foucault, uh, name whoever else, Thompson, you know, these are, these are extremely famous philosophers, yet they all write about totally different things and they all disagree with each other or would probably disagree, disagree with each other night and day, like night and day, all night, all day is what I meant to say. Like for me, uh, the thing that I like to, one of the things I like to resist is I, this idea of postmodernism as though Deleuze and Foucault have anything in common, Baudrillard and so on. Instead, this is just the title that's been bestowed upon them so that they can be intelligible against a disciplinary apparatus, uh, Anglo philosophy in the United States mostly, that can't make sense of it, that, that, doesn't, that just lacks the tools to actually comprehend what these philosophers are doing. So across time, different ideas will emerge, yet Plato and Foucault both belong to the domain of philosophy, even though philosophy departments don't touch Foucault with a 20-foot pole to their detriment. Uh, but, eh, you know, it's a good question. What is it that really unites them? Discourses are always historical. They must draw upon a history. But that does not mean that they are purely historical or only historical. Because if, as we have seen, they are shaped by other forces and influences as well. So statements and discursive fields comply with an, what he calls an historical a priori. They must embrace the idea of history a priori. So a priori means universally and not through experience. So I can say, for example, all crows are black. And this is true. Have I seen all crows? Can I verify this through experience? No, I just know it's true. It's an a priori. Or, for example, um, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Is that a good example? Maybe a better example is uh, a squared plus C b squared is equal to c squared in, in Pythagorean theorem, for example. Have I tested all triangles to see that that's true? No, but I know it's true. It's an a priori. In fact, I actually never need to test it on a triangle, and it will continue to be true. So when he says historical a priori, he says that discursive fields can never just spring up and just totally eschew or disregard everything that came before it. Because discursive fields have to have come from somewhere, and they must always, to some extent, embrace that somewhereness that they've come from in order to gain their intelligibility. And this is why the price of entry for emergent ideas and fields is really high. This might be one of the many reasons, I'm not reducing this to, uh, to, to what's going, to what Foucault is describing here, but why there is such resistance to uh, incorporating black studies programs in colleges across the US. I mean, racism, and heteropatriarchy are the primary resisting uh, factors here. But at the, as well, in the Foucauldian sense, and what he's getting at here, you know, he's saying that that's legit, like that is true, that that is the real limiting factor. But what is also going on is that because, for example, black people's histories have been systematically erased and destroyed in the United States, very deliberately so, it doesn't have the same history through the same materiality that academics desire, like written records, you know, proof of ownership, this type of stuff. Uh, because black people historically can't necessarily always furnish that kind of information, then therefore it doesn't have the right kind of history to draw from, therefore it doesn't have a history at all, according to, you know, these academic gatekeeping practices. And therefore, it is so much more difficult for it to earn the status of a discursive field in the eyes of the academic gatekeepers that often are like the guardians of their own discursive fields and very closely uh, gatekeep what is allowed in to make sure that the right ideas are, are allowed in, that the right discursive fields can actually enter those hallowed halls of the academy. So without looking at every discursive field, Foucault is making an a priori deduction here. He's saying that F 
<laughs> he's saying that he's he's deducing that all discursive fields contain a group of rules crafted through time. These rules dictate that field's relationship uh, with history as a form of dispersion in time, a mode of succession, of stability, of reactivation, a speed of deployment or rotation that belongs to it alone. But we must take this idea all the way. It's not as though the guidelines presupposed by the a priori fell upon all language, for example, and discourse one day, and we are all now under its spell, as though the historical a priori just somehow fell down from God and now is guiding, is, is one of the guiding threads uh, across any discursive field's longevity. Foucault isn't using the a priori in such a traditional way. Instead, he believes the same historical a priori should be applied to the traditional a priori to show how it may in history, kind of in the many points of contact found in history, the various places of insertion, eruption, or emergence, domains or occasions of operation, and applying it as well to understand how this history may, may be not an absolutely extringent contingence not a necessity of form deploying its own dialectic, but a specific regularity. Did you understand any of that? Me neither. I did, but uh, let me explain it to you. It would be easier if you could see the words. You know, this is on page 128 to 129 on the, I don't know, the standard version of the archaeology of knowledge that you can find with, you know, the most, is it vintage? I don't know, whatever the publisher is. Okay, what he's saying here, traditional a priori, the idea is that you can universalize some idea to everything else without actually looking at it in experience. And Foucault's like, that's kind of interesting because that implies that there's this universal truth out there in the world that can be uncovered through language. Like, for example, all crows are black. Does that actually have any meaning? You know, what does that actually mean when we say that all crows are black? How about, and this is what Foucault is saying, Foucault is saying that instead of just celebrating the a priori as a tool to find these universals, he's like, what if we looked at that as just being another discursive field that has its own rules, that actually has the kind of hubris to say that it can find these universals. I mean, what kind of apparatus is at play for us to claim, like a discursive apparatus is at, is at play, for anyone to claim that they know anything universal about this world, animals, people, etc. Yet, it's so often applied to these things. And so he's saying that maybe... The historical a priori that he's identifying here among discursive fields that point to, that have come about through regulation, have come about through various different rules and codes and, and so on, might actually be applicable to the traditional a priori that philosophers like Kant and others have used to provide, you know, so-called universal truths about the world. Maybe that's only possible because a discursive field has attained enough of a status as to claim itself or to give itself the ability to make these claims about the world, about humanity, about animals, about anything like that. And so the traditional a priori then is then subject to the same regulatory mechanisms he's been identifying the whole time. Does that make sense? Maybe, I, I don't know. I hope I make sense. Let me know if I make sense for the few people who are listening to part three of a YouTube video on Foucault. One specific Foucault book. Great algorithm material, David. Very nice. I don't care. If I, if I cared about the algorithm, I would have stopped a long time ago. So to look at this whole system of regularity is to look at the discursive archive. Archive associated with history as we saw in part one, which is first the law of what can be said, the system that covers the appearance of statements as unique events. 
The archive is what holds some systems and statements close and safely guards against others. It also permits statements and discourses to transform according to their own historical a priori. There is no homogeneous archive. Each contains its own systems of operation and so reveals the discontinuities found across all discourses despite our continued search for fancy word transcendental subject of history or telos to find there to be this unifying thread through history, this thing called history itself, or this unifying subject that is just looking back at the entirety of history and is able to place itself in, in any person's shoes throughout history and is able to just understand what's going on, even though such a thing is absolutely impossible. It is impossible to be in the mind of someone 50 years ago. You know, we have no idea, unless you're one of those people who was alive 50 years ago, then you have a good idea. But go back a few hundred years, I have no idea what it was like to live a few hundred years ago. Even in the same context, let alone if I was to think about like rural Mongolia or something, I have no idea how someone in that context thinks, how they view history and the world themselves. Like, I often think about like mirrors. You know, how many of us woke up in the morning, probably within the first few minutes that they were awake, looked in a mirror? What, you know, before people had easy access to mirrors, they may have only seen themselves once every like few weeks. Like, can you imagine that? Like, how does that change your relationship to the world? But I mean, that's, this is something I like to think about. So finally, to conclude, he collapses the considerations of statements, discourses, and archives to the archaeological method, hence the archaeology of knowledge, that doesn't look for origins, as one might assume, but designates the general theme of description that questions the already said at the level of existence, like what is said, what is intelligible, of the enunciative function that operates within it, of the discursive formation and the general archive system to which it belongs. Archaeology describes discourses as practices specified in the element of the archive. And yeah, that's that'll wrap up part three. If you like what I did, you can like, share, subscribe. If I got anything wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, yeah, I hope it was useful to you. I hope that I'm helping to demystify this text. Let me know if you are. I love, I love any words of encouragement. Uh, and if I'm not, let me know how I can make your experience better. On that note, take care.